he spoke to a, he sat down, he spoke to a court clerk that wrote down all of his answers and then read them back to the court. Um, so he seemed so weakened that he wasn't able to even speak out, which is um, quite contrary to the victims that spoke today. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. So his answers, um, you know, uh, one of the questions, his answers really had nothing to, the, the court asked very good questions um, about his knowledge of, of, of Fort Dimash, what was happening in Fort Dimash, his control um, of police. But he really didn't answer any of the questions with any specificity. I would think he sort of was evasive with all of his answers. Uh, and unlike the common law system that we're used to in the U.S., where there'd be follow-ups, et cetera, uh, the court just sort of let that go. However, he answered with how he answered. Um, on the other hand, though, he really walked away from that day feeling like Devoli was evasive and didn't ask any of the questions. So you almost didn't need the follow-up because it was quite clear um, that was not in good faith in giving his answers. What I thought was the in most interesting question in in last week's hearing with Duvalier was asked by his own lawyer, Renal George, a very intelligent um, lawyer, who asked whether or not he had a copy of a 1976 report from the U.S. government about human rights abuses that was released at the same time as an Amnesty International report on the same subject. And so Duvalier responded um, and that he had been at a meeting in Washington where meeting with meeting government as well as other international governments where they talked about how NGOs rather than promoting human rights in the country are very destabilizing to the government. And that it appeared to be a direct sort of attack to Amnesty International and it was interesting that the US was interesting first that that was what Duvalier's lawyer asked about with something having to do with the US government. Um, I spoke with one of the victims, Bobby Duval, afterwards, and he thought that Duval Duvalier's argument that day, or his testimony that day, was geared towards the US government, saying, you gave me carte blanche, you supported me, you put me in office, I just did what I was able to do, I was above the law, and that that question, his answers, and others were reminders to the US government, who is sitting in the courtroom, um, of this. So, and, and that's of course interesting also because of, we've mentioned um, throughout any inter media interviews that we can do between Brian and me and others, is the U.S. government has not spoken up and has been silent about the voting prosecution and we think, you know, the influence of Haitian politics and, and governance and the, uh, the economy in so many other areas that this is clearly something they could if they wanted to and, and should. Um, so that was Duvalier's testimony last week. Um, this week was a testimony of the victims. Um, there are about six victims, I think, that, signed, that are signed up to speak. Only two testified today. They each were uh, uh, sort of on the stand, as it were, for almost two hours. They stood, unlike Duvalier, they didn't stand. They stood, and they spoke loudly enough for everybody in the courtroom to hear. Um, and they, Jean-Claude Duvalier was not there today. We knew he wouldn't be there today, but there was an Associated Press article that came out that said he's sick, um, he's in hospital, and um, et cetera. So, but we knew he wasn't going to be there. He was not ordered to be there today. His testimony was last week. Um, so the first uh, victim that testified was Alex um, and he used to be a deputy in Tetonville. Um, and he went, he was in, in prison for about 18 months, 46 days, but in the middle of that was in Fort Dimanche, which is probably many of you know is sort of known for uh, its horrible prison abuse, torture, um, and, and conditions. So he, he talked about most of his time, he talked about being kidnapped and arrested, um, and, and held mostly in solitary confinement in the jail of Um 
and prison conditions being that on him, he had a one and a half meters by one and a half meter stone, so that he was really barely able to lie down. Um, a, a little less than what six feet by six feet. <laughs> he was barely able to lay down, and the cells had excrement, urine, blood, mosquitoes everywhere. He was kept in his underwear, and that was it. Once a day, a little bowl of food would come to his little iron door, and uh, that was his only real contact with humans except that he was able to hear tortures happening um, around him and the other cells. <clears throat> he, uh, when, he did re- that when he was in Fort Dimanche for those 46 days that he was there in 1977, that one of the questions from the judges was whether he saw people being tortured to death. Um, and his response yeah. was that he saw prisoners naked with their legs um, apart, beaten, um, on their, their buttocks and they were beaten so badly that they started defecating. Um, he didn't mention if they died or not, but you know, that was the answer to that question. Um, the second witness was Louis Duval, um, which for, for many of you, he, he spent some time in Canada and the United States. He was a very famous soccer player here in Haiti and sort of a celebrity who has a nonprofit now. Um, and I think it's been really an icon for the system, the group for Duvalier. He testified about his arrest in 1876. It seems like he was targeted because of the time he had spent abroad. Um, and he talked more about the prison conditions. He um, spent most of his, he spent some of his time in Fort Dimanche and some of it in um, Casta, the prison of St. Sardine. Um, he talked about how they were given about one bowl of cornmeal a day. He thinks it's about 300 calories. Um, and he, and for those of you on the phone, do you mind using your phone? We're having a little bit of background noise. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, he's saying that, that that this is 300 calories a day. That's how. Um, that's how most of us lost pounds quickly and started to die. Um, that in the eight months he was in Fort Dimanche, he counted 180 people die. That when people would die, the prisoners were, they were kept in blocks of cells, about 25 to 40 people in one cell. Um, that when somebody would die, they would knock on the door of the cell, the iron door of the cell, so that everybody could hear and guards would come by and take the body out and throw it into a big a big hole near the prison. One of the questions on uh, after he was found that was done by uh, Duvalier's lawyer was if you were in solitary confinement, how did you know how many people were dying? And he said, well, I was in Fort Dimanche then, I wasn't in solitary confinement. Um, we were kept in cells and that we had a system. We counted. There were about three people a week who would die um, and we each first there was uh, each cell that um, was in charge of counting on a weekly basis how many people died so that we could aggregate those numbers and maintain them. Um, the last the thing that he said of note, and then I'll have to switch over to this question, um, was that uh, he was free because he went. Uh, can I? I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, this is Neil Tadezme from Jamaica. The connection is not very clear. Uh, if you could speak a little, there's a lot of noise in the background. So I'm just to speak a little clearer, please. Sure. Yeah. No. Thanks for mentioning that. If folks could put their cell phone, I mean their phones, on mute, that would be great. I think we have over 30, if not 40, people on the line, so uh, there might be a lot of Is this is this better now? Can you hear me? Hello. Hi, can you hear me? Is this any better? I think your voice is yes. very clear. People just need to mute their phones. Okay. If folks could mute phones right now, that would be great. It's a little bit better now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so what uh, what Duval said was that he got free because in 1976, after President Jimmy Carter came into office in the United States, um, that he cared about human rights, and so he sent an ambassador to Haiti with a list of 13 names to free from 
prisons that the U.S. government at that time started putting pressure on the Haitian government um, to end abuses that they were doing. Um, that by the time they got, his name was on that list of 13 people, but that only three people were alive still uh, of the 13 people that were on the list. So he was very lucky. Um, so he was transferred in January 1977 um, to a different facility where he was cared for. He uh, apparently uh, lost weight, only weighed, I think, 120 or so pounds, which he's a big guy. He's definitely at least well over six foot tall um, and was carried back to health, but to feel like he, he really almost died. Um, both of these witnesses themselves did not experience um, torture other in addition to or any beatings, I should say. They didn't suffer any beatings and felt very, very grateful that they didn't, um, but uh, witnessed tortures and, and beatings of others and, uh, and endured their, their prison conditions. Um, I spoke with Mario right after the hearing and uh, asked him what he thought of the hearing. All of our lawyers seem to be very pleased with how it went. He also is very optimistic. He says he's very confident that this court, that this appeals court, will um, sustain a rule in our favor on the appeal, on the victim's appeal. And so what that means is that it could go back down to the trial court. Um, this would be overruling the trial court's order and there would need to be a trial um, of John claude de Vaurier, not just for the financial crimes, but also for the political violence crimes. Um, the only sticking point here, of course, is that uh, de Vaurier will have a chance, both sides will have a chance to appeal to the Court de Cassation, to the, to the uh, Supreme Court. I think it's quite likely that de Vaurier's lawyers will appeal to the Supreme Court. So uh, there's no... <laughs> that would be a whole new battle and a whole new set of judges and... Um, so um, who knows what will happen. In, in terms of time length, um, it looks like there will be at least one, if not two more hearings, where we listen to <coughs> victims' testimonies. Um, and then there might be another hearing after that with some legal arguments. But Mario thinks that this evidence was enough to sustain um, the position that there were crimes against humanity and that, therefore, it is appropriate to uh, have a trial on these crimes, which is a huge victory. I'll leave it there for now, and uh, I think it'd be great to I'll open it up to questions. Are we going to get a transcript of what you you said? Because it's I sorry I, I missed half of it. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm not sure. I, I think somebody's recording this, but I'm not positive. I'm sorry. I don't know. Yes. Okay. We should be able to send a transcript. All right, thank you. Uh, did, did you say, I'm trying to clarify, if you said that he, that Duvalier said that the government put him, the U.S. government put him there and he was just doing what he could? No, he did not say that. That was the implication. What he said was that he had a meeting with the U.S. government um, where they talked mm -hmm. about the interference of NGOs. Okay. Hey, Nicole, this is, uh, Nicole, this is Pooja. Um, I have a couple Hi, of Pooja. questions. How are you? <laughs> um, wonderful, um, wonderful summation, a very exciting time. Um, uh, my first question is about the status of the financial crimes, um, the financial crimes case. Um, is there any movement on that in Haiti? And then also, I remember that a couple of years back when he came there, when he came to Haiti, there was speculation that he had done so to um, avoid uh, getting his assets in Switzerland confiscated under Lex Duvalier. Um, do you know? Do you guys know what the status of of that is? <clears throat> so that's the first question. I and then the second question um, is basically about process going forward um, in terms of, you know, when you guys would expect the appeals court to issue a ruling, all things considered. Um, yeah, that would basically be it. Thanks, Nicole. 
table should be submitted in the event of a trial down the road. Um, we would be likely submitting new evidence in a trial, um, so that uh, will be an exciting time if we get there. In terms of the legal brief, um, we have not, uh, because a lot of the legal arguments have not been made yet, um, we have not made our, our brief available to the public. And I have not seen any other than the appeal to the Code of Cassation, the Supreme Court. I have not seen any briefs coming out of Duvalier's lawyers. Um, we have um, been able to obtain um, an amazing sort of amici brief that was coordinated through just the Center for Justice and Accountability based in San Francisco. Uh, that of course a big friend to, to Haiti victims um, through, through prior cases, they were able to put an amicus brief on the issue of crimes against humanity, raising those legal issues and sort of clarifying those legal issues that there is no um, statute of limitations limit um, for these, these crimes based on customary international law. Um, so, and that's been signed by I think 20 um, or so other organizations. So we've got that brief, we have our own brief, and, and we may have another brief. Those at some point might become public, but uh, as, as of now, they're not. A lot of these are, are arguments, though, have been codified in reports by Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. So if you go on our website, from, from IJDH.org under Duvalier Project, you'll find those reports and those really summarize the, the legal arguments quite well. Thanks. Nicole, can you, I mean, it's early days, I know, but can you summarize what you think the effect of this is being, you know, on the Haitian public politically? I mean, what kind of, you say the, the courtroom's got lots of Haitian journalists in there. What sort of effect is the reporting having? Hi, Philip. Hi. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, no, that's a great question, and it is a little hard to know now. Um, I think one of the things I've heard is that a lot of victims have not wanted to come forward because they thought that the Haitian justice system was incapable of fairly processing the cases, that it was that it was not even worth it. Um, and so they didn't even want to partake in this lawsuit, which is too bad. And I've also seen, you know, a lack of protesters that are against Duvalier, you know, against Duvalier in front of the courthouse. So it's kind of hard to tell how much this is being followed. When I ask people in the streets that are away from my office, do you know about this? The legal community definitely knows. They're calling. They think this is interesting. But the average tap-tap driver on the street kind of knows that this is happening, but really isn't following it that closely. Um, I think that it's up to the Haitian journalists to really disseminate this, and that's what we've heard, you know, we've all heard these statistics, but so many, you really would have to be at least 30 years older or older to remember at all what happened under Duvalier's time so many patients apart. Um, I think that if if we get a, a, a positive decision, and, and Mario really thinks that we will out of the Court of Appeals, that then we will have something that says, look, he came in to testify, I've on a court order, we now have a positive order out of the Court of Appeal. The Haitian justice system can and does work for justice. Um, and that, that will send a very positive signal that the justice system can uh, end in um, and But it's, it's hard to say right now how much of an impact this is all having. So I think people are so wary of this that they don't really believe that it's happening. And Nicole, if I can add something, so I was, when I was in Haiti in, in late January, I had a good talk with Mario about this, and at the time, he was really pessimistic. He was pretty much assuming that we would lose quickly in the appeals court, then we'd have to go to the, the, the Court of Cassation, the Supreme Court, where we'd probably quickly lose there, and then we'd have to go to the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, where we'd win, then we'd bring it to the Inter-American Court on Human Rights, we'd win there, and then we'd be back after three years, three to five years, back in a, in a Haitian trial court. And he really didn't expect that we'd get a fair hearing out of the appeals court. So I think the developments of the last few weeks have been have been really remarkable. I think we've completely changed the context. I think it's a combination of obviously the work of 
Nicole and the, and the BAI lawyers on the ground, but also all the journalists and who have been covering this, the activists, everybody who's been tweeting and retweeting these things. We've really kind of changed the context to the extent where there's a lot of pressure on the court and on the government to to do a hearing. And I, and I think it's that pressure really that has made the difference to get to the point where we are today. And obviously, and that's one of the reasons why I'm grateful to so many people on the call now. Um, that pressure needs to continue in order for, for for the hearing to ultimately conclude in a fair way. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think the one thing I might want to add, and I'm glad you mentioned, I forgot to mention at the beginning, was that I think one of the reasons that Duvalier was forced to come and, and testify in, in, in the way everything happened the way it did was because um, together, you know, there's so many different supporters probably that are even on this call, but uh, we were with, with Amnesty International, with Human Rights Watch, um, with the Center for Justice Accountability, for so, so many different amazing human rights organizations, all calling out to the Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Inter-American Commission Human Rights, all these different organizations to put pressure on the Haitian judicial system to make this a fair trial. I think it really worked. I think it brought so much pressure um, on, on the system, and uh, it is working, which is incredible. This is Connor. I have another question, and that is what um, what it seems like from what uh, I've been reading that the, the State Department just isn't really interested in this as an issue at all. And if you could uh, tell us a little bit by, about why you think that's the case, and then also if you think that there's uh, any kind of pressure that can be put uh, on them through Congress or any other way that might um, kind of push them to uh, change their minds. Brian, you want to take that? Uh, yeah. So I, I've had a bunch of discussions with with the State Department. One of the both the promising and, and frustrating things about the State Department is it it, it has a real all star team of of human rights lawyers. Uh, Michael Posner, who's the um, the Assistant Secretary for Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, he actually cut his teeth on Haiti cases with the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights. Uh, you've got Stephen Rapp, who's the, the war crimes ambassador, who, who did his career doing, going after people like Duvalier in, in Africa. And But despite having some very capable lawyers who understand the importance of cases like this, the State Department has not, despite a lot of effort, um, really, really stepped up. If anybody wants a good analysis of this, uh, Fran Quigley, a professor at the University of Indiana Law School, who wrote, um, wrote a post on Common Dreams and on, I believe, Truthnet called Free Michael Posner. If you just if you just Google Free Michael Posner or look on our website for it, um, you get that article. But I think it's, it's a couple of things. I think that the, that the, the administration, the U.S. administration, thinks that this could be disruptive to Haiti. Um, and I think the second thing is that, that they are friendly with the Marjali government, and this is something that the Marjali government you know, is clearly both officially and, and in a way that suits the case, make it known that it is not excited about prosecuting this case. And so I think it's just you know, somewhat standing by a friend. Um, I think that's short-sighted in both ways. I think that, yes, there is some chance for disruption, the sense that people go to the streets and you've got, you know, you have to bring in police to control that. But in fact, as, as these hearings show, the, the, the Asian justice system can, in fact, um, pull this off. And I think that if it does pull it off, and, and, and Duvalier is given a fair trial, you set a great precedent against political violence and corruption. And once you do that, you're making a, a very substantial contribution to the medium and long-term stability, both financial and political, of Haiti. And so I, I'm, I'm disappointed that the U.S. government is not taking the opportunity. And it's not a question. One thing the U.S. says, oh, we can't, it, can, it, we can't interfere in, in, in Haitian politics, which is inconsistent with its interfering in so many ways, as, as Nicole mentioned. But it's also not a question of, of imposing U.S. will. It's Haiti has an international law obligation to prosecute and the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights, and the International Human Rights Watch have all made that clear. And it wouldn't be, it certainly wouldn't be overstepping for the United States to say that it recognizes that. In terms of what people can do, that's a good question, Connie. Maybe we'll 
think about it. We've worked with members of Congress who have, who have made statements, who have approached the State Department. That hasn't worked. Uh, I've, I've had many meetings and it hasn't worked. Uh, but maybe we should think of some kind of a, of a, of a popular... We, we actually had many, many people around here sign the letter back, but I think it was a year and a half ago we had a letter signed by dozens of human rights organizations urging the State Department to prosecute. But maybe this is a good time to, to recirculate that letter in order to do some other action or put some public pressure. I, I, um, excuse me, this is Abiyomi um, Manrique Poland from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, I would like to uh, ask the question next. It's really a lot of background noise. We encourage people to mute their phones again. Uh, this is Abiyomi Manrique Poland from Atlanta, Georgia. I would like to ask a question. Yes, please. We want your question. One thing though is before you start, so you aren't asking questions. Hello. Hello. Go ahead. Yes, Erica, go ahead and ask you a question. Yes, I would. I would like to know if. Uh, presenters have any idea how this is being covered in the uh, the rest of the, the greater Caribbean? Is it a focus of the news agencies there and how people are reacting to this, uh, this scenario? Yeah, I haven't seen any coverage by any of any of Haiti's neighbors. There's actually a very good article today on a Haiti justice issue by Ricky Singh of Barbados about the, the, the UN response to to the cholera claim, but I have not seen anything in the uh, in the Caribbean press about the Duvalier case. And I would follow up on my own question and check and see what has happened, um, how it's being covered, and what is uh, the discussion that would be taking place. Thank you very much. And we also have, and I'll ask, uh, uh, Mirtha Dizome from Jamaica, if, if she's seen anything in the Jamaican press. Sister from Jamaica, have you heard or seen anything in the Jamaican press if you are in Jamaica? I don't know, we probably lost her. Okay, yeah, maybe she's she's lost. But, but she, uh, Mirtha actually usually sends me things from the Caribbean press that she sees, so um, I have, and I've not seen anything from her, so I, my guess is this hasn't been covered. That is, that is really terrible. If that's the case, that is really, really terrible. Of all places, it should be should have been covered in the Caribbean press. But I don't want to speak ahead of my without doing the research to to see to inquire. Hey, um, this is uh, Matthew Lee from Inner City Press. I wanted to just ask about about the cholera after the UN cholera uh, dismissal of claims. Um, one, do you think this case, in terms of, uh, of in terms of the Haitian justice system, could have any impact on the ability to litigate the cholera claims there? And also, just if, if either of you can provide a uh, what's been the, the response in Haiti to the dismissal by by the UN of those claims. I'll let you take the first part of that question. I can take the second part. Okay, that sounds fair. Um, I, I, I think you know, I think any opportunity to strengthen the justice system is a good one, and and that's what one of the reasons why I think this case is so important. In addition to the precedent, is this is an opportunity to for everybody in the system to raise their game. These kinds of cases attract attention, they attract interest, they attract resources. And uh, one example of how that works is the Roberto case that we did in 2000, where it really raised the Haitian justice system performance to a new level. Not only did it perform at a new level, there was a perception both by people in the justice system and by, by the constituents, the citizens of the country, that the system could do much better, and that really had a, had a ripple effect. And the Duvalier case is another opportunity to do that, and as is the Collar case. You know, we have filed a call, the Collar case in, in Haitian court, um, but that is one of the alternatives, and I think that doing a good a fair trial of, of Jean-Claude Duvalier uh, could pave the way for a fair trial for, for the victims of the cholera epidemic. In terms of the second question, um, the impact of the cholera dismissal by the U.S., um, for folks that care about human rights, um, that is a question that a lot of people are talking about. And um, I mentioned that we have a group of law students from um, Boston College here this week. 
um, and they were interviewing um, an organizer uh, about demonstrations and, um, and those types of things. And uh, the question that he asked to them had to do with cholera. What are you going to do um, about the UN dismissal of cholera claims? Um, it's something that I think is on the mind of a lot of people. I think there's also an acceptance, though, that in Haiti, the UN um, often does whatever they want with impunity, and they're sort of used to this, unfortunately. Um, but at the same time, people that we know that care about human rights are very, very uh, upset about this, um, discouraged by it. And unfortunately, not the cause. And I think at this point, are wondering what can be done. They don't necessarily want this to go away. They want to know what's the next step. How can we find, keep finding? They realize how unjust this is. Um, they know that people keep dying. Um, and you know, there is a color elimination plan that was announced here. I think it was last week. Um, but the Haitian people don't know about it. Nobody I have a, I've talked to knows about the color elimination elimination plan. Um, so it's certainly not being disseminated by the Haitian government, by the Haitian media, or by the UN. So I think a lot of Haitians just don't see an end to the tests that are happening by cholera and, and want justice and want want this to stop. Thanks a lot. That's helpful. Hey, do we have any other questions? I have one. Go ahead. Yes, uh, the question I have is, uh, are we going to um, rally around? Are, are you all going to, is there anything we can do on this end, those of us who uh, um, want to raise the, raise the ante here? and keep the pressure on, is there any, any central source or organization that we could contact or, you know, find some way to support uh, keeping the pressure on in the courts in uh, Haiti? You know, that's a really good question, and, and I'll answer it by what I'd suggest, unless Nicole has more concrete suggestions, I'd suggest that, that Nicole go back to the, the Haitian lawyers and find out what they think people can do to help out. Um, and as I mentioned, I think we'll probably circulate something soon in terms of pushing the United States just to take a stand. But a couple things that are pretty easy that people can do. There's been a lot of really good Twitter reports from the, uh, for, from the courtroom. Um, Nicole and her Twitter feed is Buddhist lawyer. Um, if, you just put in, if you just put in, do, if you're on Twitter, you'll search for Duvalier, you'll get a lot of these people. Nicole's been doing it. There's a few different journalists have been doing it. Uh, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch have been, have been sending Twitters and a few other people on the ground in Haiti. And I'd encourage everybody to, to just keep the word circulating by, by retweeting uh, some of the good tweets on the ground. Certainly people who, who want to write, there's plenty of room to, to write, and we'd be happy to, to suggest angles for people who want to write op-ed type pieces to their paper as to why this is important or why the U.S. government should step up. Um, all those things, things are useful. And I'll let Nicole add whatever she has to that. Yeah, I, I also Thank love you. to see... I would also love to see more movement within Haiti and, and, and pressure on the Haitian government as well um, to do that. I think you know that there has been a lot of media covering this, and um, and they've. I think that's really important. But to the extent we can have more op-eds, like Brian mentioned, and more tweets in in Creole and in French as well, and, and get this more disseminated among Haitian diaspora groups in the United States. Um, you know, potentially putting pressure on congressional members in your districts in Florida and in New York, and you have some really good representatives. Um, I think I think what I've heard a lot of is that uh, there are a lot of Duvalier victims out there, unfortunately, um, and that for so many reasons that are very understandable, they haven't. A lot of them haven't mobilized around this. Um, and if there is any chance that they had hope, hope, it's perhaps they can renew hope. Um, and, and, and try and, and become, join the activism, I think that could make a huge, huge impact both locally on U.S. representatives to extent they're living in the U.S., um, but also within Haiti as well. 
Miss Nicole, thank you very much. I, uh, I'm also um, uh, I'm a, a member of a community radio program that covers the Latin America and the Caribbean uh, in Atlanta here at uh, WRFG 89.3. And um, I was wondering if there's anybody from your organization, and I'm, I'm, I'm making some inroads and in contacting the Haitian community here in Atlanta to do some coverage in that area, but um, also if I can have someone from your organization as well to interview at some point in time in the future, I'll be very thankful. Yes, we would be very happy to do that. Thank you for asking. Thank you. And how, how would we stay in contact? I mean, how would I be able to reach you? Yeah, anybody can reach me with questions um, at Nicole, N-I-C-O-L-E, at ijdh.org. Feel free to email me and also to something what Brian said. Follow us on Twitter, which is at IJDH. And then also myself is at Buddhist Lawyer. Okay. No. Any of those ways, keep in touch with us, please. Okay, because I did get an email from your organization. And I, I'm sure I'm going to see if um, that's how I found out about this uh, webinar. Uh, let's see. But thank you for for uh, agreeing to support us as well. Um, hi, it's Roger Annis. Just a couple of quick points from, from Canada. We'll, um, we'll be having meetings in the next uh, week and two weeks in, in Vancouver, Montreal, at least, to um, to try and get better organized on this issue because uh, it was really quite, has been striking and disturbing, the, the fall-off of news coverage of the, of the case, precisely at the moment when it was actually making some progress by uh, bringing him to trial. I don't think there was a single report in a Canadian newspaper about the outcome of the first appearance. There was you know, a, little, a few articles and even not very much there saying that he'd been ordered to appear by the judge on the, on the 21st. I don't, I don't quite understand this because there has, last year there were a um, pretty steady stream of reports. There were even a, a, at least one editorial in the Toronto Star and it seems to have dropped away. So it does point to the need for us to um, to get organized on this in Canada. It seems that unless we're uh, doing more pressuring and advocating that we're not going to get um, the uh, response from uh, from media. And we're still a long way from getting uh, anyone in Ottawa prepared to uh, speak out on the issue. And I guess that's another aspect of the recent developments that are uh, disturbing for us. Um, I did notice in the Haitian press in the last couple of days some pretty significant um, uh, statements both on the cholera issue um, uh, and now on the, um, there's an editorial in today's Nouvelliste, or yesterday's Nouvelliste, about what happened to the hundreds of millions of dollars that Haiti gained from the petro program. So there's obviously a capacity in Haiti, and in official circles even in Haiti, to, to question um, some of the policies of the present government. But I, I guess it's still the case that the, the, the Duvalier process is a, mostly a hands-off for a people, shall we say, in uh, higher up in Haitian society, but with hopefully with time and with the, the kind of work that's happening, that uh, even that can begin to, to turn around. So so that's a brief summary from, from us uh, here north of the border. You know, it's it's, uh, it's very interesting that uh, Argentina has made a move that I think we could, I wish could translate into what is happening with Duvalier in, in Haiti. Yeah. yeah, the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR, did a really good article on our Haiti blog that talks about the U.S. government as well as sort of puts this into context of how historic this prosecution is against this oppressive dictator who was in the same, you know, time historically as Yoshi and others. Um, it's a really good article that I recommend folks watching. For you, Roger, um, think... I was going to email, but since you're on the phone, I just did an interview, and some others might be interested, I just did an interview um, with Carol off the show As It Happens on TRI, um, and so I just taped that show about a, about an hour ago, and it should be broadcast this evening. So at least one CBC um, program is interested. Yeah, that's that's a very important program. It's probably the most likely to listen to, so that's good to uh, to know that. I'll write them a letter and thank them, and maybe I'll have to look in my file. I might have to apologize for them for, to them for having <laughs> in the last couple of weeks. Or who knows, maybe uh, because I wrote the letter, they're doing it. Who knows? <laughs> Carol's questions were very...
very, very good. Um, in general, I have found, you know, last week, um, Out of Zero was in Haiti. They recorded. Um, we got some, some interest from the BBC, Mark Doyle, and then um, a, a local TV, world TV program. Um, but really, that's about all the press. And then newspapers. Newspapers, you know, the AP, obviously, and then some others. And then a few articles. But really, that's about all the news internationally that this is not the economist wrote an awesome <laughs> not just saying that which is on the line but the economist wrote a really good um article linking impunity with the volume and um and the news and the news so with the cholera case um but other than that really there hasn't been that much coverage and there was much more coverage after the volume testified versus the victim testifying of course even though I thought their stories were much more compelling. <laughs> Nicole, this is Jasmine, uh, Church World Service. I just want to ask one quick question. Um, I have to shoot off soon. I'm sure everybody else does too. Um, uh, what could happen to Duvalier if this goes through and he is found guilty? What's the maximum penalty, the maximum charge he's facing? Uh, that's a good question, Brian. And is, and is he likely to get it, given his, he's, what, in his 80s and he's ailing? He's 61, um, but he is in hospital now. He's how old is he? He's only 61. Yeah, he was 19 years old when he was made president for life. He's 61? He was a baby. Yeah. Blimey, I thought he, he looks was older than that. He looks like 80. The wages of sin. Anyway, what, what, could, what could happen to him? What, 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 what's he facing? Okay, so the, 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 the sentence for premeditated murder, and I believe for for the um, for some of the more serious uh, torture charges is um, is life imprisonment. For, for, for murder, I know for premeditated murder without an excuse, it, it, it's life in prison. And so my guess is that probably would it be, be although it, it is possible that that most of the cases that are, that are there are false imprisonment cases and i believe those will be those, the the likely penalty for that is i think 10 to 12 years depending on on exactly what is proven but in typically in haitian courts there's there's a the judges do not have a lot of discretion you, you, there's a basic charge for the, the basic statutory sentence for the crime and then it can be raised or lowered depending on on different factors and but it's a pretty it's pretty much a you know a calculation according to the book to, as to what somebody gets okay brian brian, brian what, what uh, nicole what what do you what do you actually have to prove here it is is missing link the, the guys who say he told me to do it or the piece of paper that says he knew actually in play here. I mean, I, I suppose there's the legal thing, what you actually need to prove, you know, crimes against humanity, et cetera, et cetera, in terms of his knowledge or for planning of those. And then there's the practical one as to what you think you might need in the Haitian context. In terms of the, in terms of the formal, so what he was, he was the... We don't have anybody, as far as I know, none of the victims are going to say Duvalier tortured me or I saw him shoot somebody. And so it is based on his leadership role. Now, there, there's one way of establishing liability is the, the, the jury, what, what his leadership role was according to law. And his leadership role according to law was head of the armed forces and head of the Tonton Makuts. So he did have that kind of... Uh, official control and what he will then say is say well i won't have I, I didn't have the real control and then he, and he can he can introduce evidence to say that i really didn't control i think that evidence will be much more uh, persuasive at the beginning of his reign when he was 19 than towards the end of his reign when he had been in, in, in office for 15 years and had appointed many of the people running running the uh running torturing um, but then we can also we can also get liability by showing uh, de facto practical elements of control, and, and there's there's plenty of that. Um, in the sense, he did he did he did transfer people. He was able to hire and fire people. Um, and then there's another thing we can do is he has an obligation, even if he wasn't involved in overseeing um, people who were 
doing crimes. In his job, he had an obligation once he was aware of any massive human rights violations to punish the people who investigated, punish people who did it. And we have ample evidence reports from you know, from Amnesty International Human Rights Watch, the Inter-American Commission, many embassies saying that they gave to uh, to Duvalli these reports that said there are these problems. And they weren't all corrected. You know, one of the things he did say in his trial was that, oh, I was, when I was told of some problems, I corrected them. Um, there's very strong evidence that that's not true. He did he did correct some, often in a very cosmetic way, but that he did not he did not investigate uh, or correct many of the many of the problems, and clearly did not punish the people who were who were responsible for it. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, my name is Gima from Atlanta, Georgia. And uh, it, uh, Duvalier just keep comparing his regime with the current regimes after him, and which means that you know if it seems like you know the after the post regime of Duvalier has more crimes. So what would the implication the implication of the next turn after Duvalier? Okay, Nicole sounds me. I think she wants me to take that. Um, you know, I think, you know, first, first of all, it's not an excuse. The fact that other people committed crimes is not an excuse for him committing crimes. Um, in terms of in terms of prosecution of other people, I think that I think that no one is above the law, and that if there is serious evidence for any of the value successors, then that should be brought before. Of course, I will say there's serious evidence against Duvalier because I've seen the human rights reports. I've seen the boxes and boxes filled with reports of people tortured, full of checks written to cash for $50,000. And so I'm confident in saying that there is a case against Jean-Claude Duvalier. I'm not confident for most of his successors. I mean, we were involved in a case for, for the, the, the leaders of the 91 to 94 dictatorship where they were in fact all convicted based on a lot of evidence um, other than that I'm not sure for any of the successors right up through the current regime if there is that kind of, of documentation if there is I think we should bring it forward if there isn't I don't think it's it's a, a justified use of the justice system and in many cases you if, if you're going after people without have the, the documents to prove or other evidence to prove that they should be in court, then I think that itself is a, is a human rights violation. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm pretty sure, you know, you know, from Duvalier until, uh, you know, until up to, you know, 2010 or 2009, even up to 2008, uh, we have plenty of evidence, you know, human atrocities against the Haitian people, you know, each government, each regime has come with its own uh, paramilitaries, you know, to uh, terrify, you know, it, it's not a matter of evidence that has been the case. And the reason that I bring this, uh, you know, what what is it that, you know, if, you know, they would try to have some kind of national reconciliation, well, of course, national reconciliation is not without justice. Uh, but it's somehow in a South African way, you know, so that we can really bring peace, you know, in Haiti, because uh, they're going to have to kill every Haitian, because all Haitians commit crimes, you know, in Haiti, you know, under any kind of governments of the past. Yeah, that's a good question. And first of all, I mean, obviously you answered in part that you can't have reconciliation without justice. Um, I actually think the justice system is a good way of working some of these issues out because if you don't have justice, then you can just have the cycle of violence where, where everybody uses violence and there's no, everybody can equally say, oh, someone else did it, therefore that justifies my violence. And I think that nobody can justify violence against innocent civilians because other people did the same thing. And, and um, you know, there, there have been allegations, and again, I've worked on some cases against some, some regimes, and where there's been cases, some cases we haven't brought because we didn't, we have the evidence, and some cases we did. And, and, and you also, you have to make the distinction between criminality that takes place during an administration's um, term.
government office and criminality that is that is um, attachable to those um, to the to the top officials. You know, today I'm sure there's some police officers somewhere in the United States or, uh, who who you know who beat somebody up. That is not necessarily imputable to to President Obama. If President Obama systematically um, supports police who are beating up his political opponents, I think that, you know, then you have a case, but you don't automatically do that. And I think that, that, that there's been a lot of talk about responsibility for people at the top without people going through and making the links, which is, you know, that's something we're doing in the Duvalier case. You have to make the links. You have to go through the effort. You have to figure out, you know, what is the exact gain of between the person at the top and the person doing the, the actual crime and, and figuring out the different factors that make that crime done at the low level imputable to the top level. Yeah, thank you. You know, you know my last question is, I mean, I'm just concerned, uh, you know, about the status of limitations and the national law. Is there any such thing, you know, you know, and you can go so far back up to 25 years to, you know, to prosecute someone, prosecute someone, you know, what does the international law, you know, say about it, you know, status of limitation? Uh, sure, I'll take that too, and Nicole can add in anything if I'm missing it. Uh, so but that, that's one of, uh, of, of uh, Mr. Duvalier's main arguments, and it's the, it's the argument that the, the, the juge d'instruction used to dismiss the cases is that, that the, these crimes are far beyond the 10-year statute of limitations that Haiti has. And that is true, but there, it is beyond 10 years, but there is a principle in international law that if it involves crimes against humanity, then you do not apply the statute of limitations. And so, so there really is not. So if someone's committing something that's a crime against humanity, which, which there's a very specific definition of what that is. I'm not going to get it exactly right, but it, it's certain serious crimes, genocide, murder, torture, uh, rape, and that are done as part of a widespread and systematic attack against civilians on account of their political opinion or membership in a group. And so if you, if you meet all those factors, then, then it does become a crime against humanity, and under international law, um, no statute of limitations should be applied. The way that it's applied in Haiti, and this has been some, this is one of the things that that, that, that Duvalier's lawyers have argued that it doesn't apply to Haiti. Um, they, they, they correctly say that he has not signed. There's actually a convention on the non-applicability of. of statute of limitations to crimes against humanity. He is not a party to that statute, and then the Duvalier's lawyers are correct in saying that. The reason why that international law principle of no statute of limitations is applicable to Haiti is that the Inter-American Court has said it is. And so Haiti has ratified both the American Convention on Human Rights and the statute of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights. And once Haiti ratifies a treaty, according to the, the Haiti's own constitution, ratifying that treaty directly incorporates it into international law. And the Inter-American Court has has interpreted the, the Inter-American the American Convention of saying that, that statute of limitations don't apply. And this is this has been in cases in Argentina, in Peru, in um, I think Brazil and, and, and some other South American countries. Um, and, and those countries have accepted it. There's actually a very interesting Argentine case where the court Supreme Court it was sent up to the court, the Inter American Court, the Inter American Court said you can't apply on statute of limitations. The Argentine Supreme Court said, uh, when it got back to them, they said, We really disagree with this decision but we have no choice where it's binding law because Argentina has has, uh, has, has accepted the binding jurisdiction of the court. And, and, and Haiti's in the same position now. It's accepted the binding jurisdiction, so, so the Inter-American Court's pronouncement that it is a, you know, is a, is a right guaranteed by the American Convention on Human Rights that, to the victims that the statute of limitations is not applied. Okay, thank you. And there's, that, that's explained, especially in, the, the, so in some of the materials on our websites. So our website, again, I don't know if Nicole mentioned it, but again, it's um, ijdh.org. And then we've got a, a section on the Duvalier case where we have the, the Human Rights Watch report, for instance, talks about that. Some of the statements from the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights and the uh, UN High Commission for Human Rights talk about it. And for people who read French, there's a really good article by... Um, by a guy named Johnson Mardi, M-A-R-D-I, 
um, in French that, that um, explains a lot of the, the details of how the international law applies in this situation. But Brian, just just one 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 thing there. You, you you said most of the cases now, the victims that Nicole's been detailing are lined up. The six are illegal detention. But crimes against humanity, you you listed a whole load of serious criteria or thresholds you could reach there to 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 reach that you know that standard of uh, of prosecution, so to speak. Um, is there a disconnect there? You no, know, so okay, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about some of those details. So, so we, if we just brought one case and said this person was was beaten, and that's all we talked about was what, what happened to that person, then we would not have crimes against humanity. But, um, but well, torture and, and, and uh, false imprisonment is is one of the, the the types of crimes that can be a crime against humanity. And then we have to go through each of we jump through the hoop for each of the. Uh, each of the the qualifications yeah, required. Yeah, the qualifications. Yeah. We explained that this is a wide part of a widespread and systematic attack, which is what uh, Alex Fisame was talking about when, as the mentioned, he was talking about that this was a system that was set up, and and, and so we say yes, we're joining. I think there's I think there's there's uh, 28 official plank complaints before the court, but our evidence and, and the test that we've presented in writing and the testimony of the witnesses has shown, and it will continue to show, that there were many other people who were, this was part of, 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 of tens of thousands. Yeah, so th this is why what they saw in jail is so important, because they saw so many people and the three deaths a week and everything else. Yes, and also that's why the, 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 the reports from Amnesty International and the Inter-American Commission on Human yeah. Rights are so important. Yeah, support that, yeah. Sure. And, and also other things like the fact that why they were arrested is important. So when 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 um, you know, people when when Alex Fisame was getting beaten, and I don't know the details, and Nicole can say if he talked about this, uh, whether whether the whether the jailer said you know this is to make you shut up so you stop stop going to meetings, um, that kind of evidence is going to come out and and to show that this was done because of their political um, because of their political positions and, and political activities. Thanks. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I have heard that uh, around seven uh, or so years ago, there had been a conviction overturned of a paramilitary leader, uh, Louis Jodel Chamblain, more or less because he had friends in the new government, and that the risk of something similar unfolding here, seeing as how the initial attempt to dismiss the case that happened right when Mark Tlaib came into power and there have been allegations that there's a, a lot of people from uh, the General Duvalier base uh, and supporters of him uh, in this, this current government. Is that potentially a risk to the prosecution or is uh, this new stage of the appeals court potentially uh, independent enough uh, as a judiciary? I think you've really hit upon the upon the issue, and the quick answer is we don't know and we'll find out. Um, I think that if you look at the course of this prosecution where you had a very zealous prosecution, and as soon as President Martelly came in, that, that zealous prosecution stopped. And just a little bit of background, that several members, I don't know of anybody, any member of, of President Martelly's cabinet who was an active Duvalierist, but there are several members, including one of his former prime ministers, but several of his ministers over his term have been the sons of ministers and other high officials in the Duvalier government. The, um, it's been widely reported that Nicolas Duvalier is an official counselor in the National Palace. Recently, the prime minister's office has been denying that, uh, but there's been many reports of people who see him in the in the um, in the palace. And certainly, the fact that the government has not been prosecuting Duvalier uh, leads to the conclusion that 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 is supportive of him. And the question, you know, if you look at the the, the decision, obviously made by the prosecutor saying drop both the charge, that that appears politicized. If you look at the the, the order by the judge dropping the uh, Dropping the political violence charges that appears politicized, and, and, and you know, obviously, I can say every case we lose it's because it's political. But if you look at it, it was only a couple pages long. It's a fairly complicated issue um, where we had we had presented fairly complicated evidence, and you have many other people putting in some very strong legal analyses. Instead of going through those legal analyses and, and, and meeting the arguments made, the the, the uh, investigating judge wrote like a two-page thing, just dismissing it and clearly not 
reaching the important legal issues, which makes me, uh, which convinces me that the decision was made more on the politics than on than on, on the law. And I think we're going to see. I think that if you had asked, well, I know that if you'd asked Mario uh, six weeks ago, he would have said we've got very little chance at the court of appeals that that the government's going to. Uh, going to uh, exercise its influence and that we're not going to get a, it's unlikely we'll get a fair tr- trial. I think that has been changed. I think it's, it's p- perhaps we, we uh, underestimated the, the courage of the Court of Appeals, but I think it's, it, it's also the fact that there has been such interest and has been a, kind of a public outcry in favor of a fair prosecution. It just makes it much easier for the appeals court to, you know, to step up and to do a good job, and I think this is a, you know, this is an example of, 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 a, of a virtuous cycle. I think that that every trial by by pushing, we got the we got the the the, the, the court felt um, either comfortable or under pressure to to ensure that Duvalier testifies. Once he testifies, then that gets out to the to the whole public. The public in Haiti is very engaged in this issue, and then, and then that will increase the, the, the support for the prosecution. And certainly today, the fact that you had, and it will be widely reported on the radios tonight, tomorrow, you had the victims talking about what happened, that will have a very important effect on, on Haitian society, especially the you know, over half of Haitians alive today were born well after Duvalier left. And so this is a, a uh, an excellent opportunity to to do popular education, which I'm pretty comfortable that that popular education on this issue will lead to a stronger constituency for for justice. Okay, thank you. Is it possible to ask about next steps in the cholera um, situation? Uh, sure, I'll give you. I'll give you a quick, the quick next step is that right now we're working, I'm actually in New York to, exact, to do exactly that. We're working on, it, on preparing the case to file on a national court. Uh, we haven't decided which national court, the options that we're looking at most closely are Haiti, uh, U.S. court and courts in the Netherlands and Belgium. But we are prepared. We don't think that there's any opportunity to convince the UN to revisit its decision to to deny our claim. We first tried to do it within the UN internal procedures. That door appears to be closed and locked. And so we're we're now going to go to a national court to say that that the uh, the national court should not allow the UN to invoke the immunity because the UN is refusing to comply with its reciprocal obligation to provide. Uh, to provide an alternate mechanism for justice. Wow. Okay. Brian, Brian, this is Dutch national courts, not not the international criminal court, right? right? Correct. As far as we know, there's no there's no international court that would accept jurisdiction in this case. So we would have to do it international. And and why um, the Netherlands as an option? Um, well, the Netherlands and and Belgium have have both had a. a Fairly have a record of, of being fairly progressive on human rights issues in general, uh, but more important than that, there's been several uh, European Court of Human Rights decisions saying that basically saying immunity cannot mean impunity. That if a an international organization fails to provide an alternate mechanism, then the court should not enforce the immunity provision. And so those, we don't have as, as strong language in a U.S. court, although there's other advantages to having a U.S. court. And so that's really what we're weighing. Is it is it better to, to take the advantages of a U.S. court, which would, the, the parts of the advantage, the damages are higher. It's a very highly respected court system, and it's something that's much closer for the Haitians to get to than than, than, than Europe, uh, but there's also advantages in the European court because of that European Court of Human Rights jurisprudence. But 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 Brian, you're not you're not, you're thinking again of going to national courts in Belgium and and, and the Netherlands, not not to an EU court or a European yes, well, Union. Court. Well, so that we we file initially in a national court. We rely on the European courts jurisprudence, and we might end up having to go to the European court. So so we filed in Belgium, and the Belgian court dismisses it because of the immunity issue. We would then go up to the European court, we'd appeal to the European court, uh, and and get them to instruct the, ask them to instruct the the Belgian court to not not invoke the immunity. And and the Belgians or the Dutch are the best options rather than Danes or Swedes or Finns? 
Yeah, we'd be happy. We should talk about this. We have other suggestions. Most of the, the, the people that we've talked to so far have said that those two countries are probably the best. But we'd certainly like to have anybody with other suggestions, and we'll, 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 we'll look at anything that might help. Um, Brian, one thing on that is when you read the SOFA, um, you know, basically the Standing Claims Commission was supposed to kick in as soon as there was a petition, right? Correct. Now, there's no distinct, as I read it, there's no distinct mechanism to say how that happens, except that you're supposed to have one appointee from the Haitian government, nominated by the Haitian government, one from the um, from the UN, and one by mutual agreement, as, as I understand it. Why, why can, in a, in a Haitian court, could you not take action to say the Haitian government has failed to live up to the sofa by not nominating somebody, its, its candidate for the Standing Claims Commission? Yeah, there's actually some lawyers who, who, who did that. Um, some lawyers that, that are actually that have worked with the BAI on some other cases. To tell you the truth, Mario Joseph and the other BAI lawyers, they've been working pretty hard on Duvalier lately, and, and I haven't had a chance to talk to them about that. But there are some Haitian lawyers who, are, who uh, did they call it a somation to the Haitian government, asking the government to explain why it hasn't followed through on, on, on the SOFA. And I think that's a very interesting tag. It would be interesting to see to see whether whether that works, although it might be too late now that you have the UN that, that, that is formally denied consideration of these claims. Um, I'm not sure how that would work out. And especially one, one of the th things that's, that, that makes it a little bit uh, it's interesting, is one word, to, to pursue this case is there isn't much precedent. The, the Standing Claims Commission has been, as far as we know, in every status of forces agreement, which has been part of every peacekeeping mission for 60 years. But the Standing Claims Commission, despite that, has never been set up in a single time. And so we don't have a lot of precedent. There is some ambiguities. Um, in the, in the process for setting it up. And our position was we weren't necessarily insisting on a standing claims commission. We were willing to work with the with the UN to come up with something as long as it provided basic fairness to, to our clients, we'd be willing to consider um, a, a whole range of possibilities. But yeah, the UN but decision may, is may you, not going to consider it. Might, might you not have to try and do something like that to cover yourself in another national jurisdiction? Because, you know, that's the agreement on which basically uh, Minusta came in, UN troops came in, that's the agreement between the Haitian and uh, Haitian government and the UN on which these people operate in this country. Um, that is nominally the first step, isn't it? Um, I mean, yeah, it, it, a, a national court might say to you, for instance, well, you know, what have you done to get the Standing Claims Commission up and run? Um, yeah, we don't think that's an obstacle. I don't want to get too much into the details. I hope we can have a, have a private discussion on this um, if, if you think it's desirable. But, but briefly, the the, the, the the SOFA is vague enough that I think that there's other upper, there's other things besides the Standing Claims Commission that, that, that would be acceptable to it. And in fact, it happens every day. I mean, the minister has a claims unit that is processing claims all the time and providing compensation. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a long UN tradition of doing that. And so I don't think that we needed or the UN needed to necessarily fit into the box of the Standing Claims Commission, which has never been set up. I think that, that, that what the, the right is not to have the Standing Claims Commission, the right of the victims is to have a fair mechanism for dispute resolution. And, and so we don't want to get tied up in what the Haitian government should do. Our focus is on the UN, which has an obligation to provide a remedy. We're flexible on that remedy, but the UN has foreclosed any discussion of this. And so so we're now going to go into a national court and say, it's not that the UN refused to set up the State Claims Commission, it's that it refused to give, give a remedy, which is what our, at the end, our client's right is to a remedy, not to a Claims Commission. Sure. Because, and our, part of our problem with the State Claims Commission is that that itself could be problematic um, the, the, as you mentioned, the commission is set up with a representative from the UN, a representative from Haiti, and then a third representative of those named. In this situation, you've got the UN, who's a party. You've got the Haitian government that is, has said quite clearly that they don't they don't think that this case has merit, and so that even if they did some establish a standing claims commission according to the rules, we would say that that commission does not meet our 
basic due process requirements because it's made up of people who have already prejudged or it's named by organizations that have already prejudged this case to be to be meritless. So we don't really want to get hung up on the standing claims commission. It's really the fundamental right to the justice of our clients. Yeah, I, I, I just wonder if somebody outside of, of you, uh, IJDH and BAI, you know, some sort of august legal body or, le or legal group shouldn't be trying to keep pressure on the UN to say, well, why hasn't this happened? You know, I mean, it, completely aside from what you do and how you proceed, the, the, the UN is off the hook until another national jurisdiction agrees to even consider this and probably is off the hook then anyway. I don't know. I mean, I just... If, if you had a bunch of law professors or something, right, or people who've been involved in UN law, and, you know, there are some case histories goes back here, don't they, as you know, in Bosnia and elsewhere, and say, well, why has this thing not met? Why has it not been activated? Why have you not nominated? I mean, it wouldn't interfere with what you were doing. I mean, yeah, we've been working. I mean, there are some people who are pushing. Not hard enough, but there are people pushing within the UN system and, and, and people from outside on a lot of those a lot of those issues. Probably not someone particularly pushing the, the setting up the commission in Haiti, but more general that the UN needs to respond more responsibly to these cases. Okay, right. Thanks. Okay, we've, we've held uh, Nicole longer than we said we would, um, and I know she's, she's pretty tired after, after a, a long day and a long week of, 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 uh, of work on the Duvalier case. So I think we'll probably um, bring the call to an end now, but I'd like to thank Nicole, obviously, for, for coming on and for everybody else for asking so many great questions. And we'll, we'll uh, send out a message soon, and I think, I think tonight's, conversation was very valuable and, and if we can convince the call to come next Thursday um, I'd like to do that and so we'll definitely let you know about that uh, in the meantime please continue to, to, to keep spreading the word and to uh, you know by Twitter by Facebook by sending emails on to, to keep the profile of this case up there thank you thank you very much for uh, creating this space that we can have this conversation and to continue to be informed this is Abayomi Manrique in Atlanta uh, signing off. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you thank very you. much, Nicole and Brian. Thank, thank you, Michelle. Bye bye. Keep it up. Bye bye. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nicole. Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Goodbye.